Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Carrillo. I'm with Southern California Crossroads here in Los Angeles. Thank you all for joining this breakout session. For the sake of time, I will do my best to be brief so that we can give the speakers uh, the most time possible uh, to share. There are hyperlinks uh, on the agenda for each of the speakers if you're interested in learning more about them and reading their bio. The order in which we will go will be um, Lisa will go first, then John, and then Natalia. If anyone needs interpretation, there's a language bar. There's a language button on the bottom bar, and uh, Marcella will provide instructions if you need to access uh, uh, English or Spanish, whatever your preference is. Um, everyone should please stay muted until you're speaking. The chat function. Somebody's got me. <laughs> Um, everyone, let's see, uh, the chat function will be open for people to post their questions and we'll call on them when it's time for Q&A. Speakers will each have approximately six minutes to present their approach or their methodology, so to speak, in regards to the topic. And then I'll follow up with the question. Um, we'll, leave, we'll try to leave a few minutes at the end for questions and answers. So let's uh, go ahead and start with Lisa. And then John and Natalia, if you can please introduce yourself, your organization, and perhaps what um, what area, what location uh, your your work is is done in. Um, my name is Lisa Pineda. I'm the um, mental health clinical director for a program called Terra Firma, which is located in the South Bronx in New York City. It is a program designed to work with unaccompanied minors, and we've expanded to work with um, AWC as well. Perfect. Thank you. John? Hi, good afternoon. I'm John Rich. I'm co-director of the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice at Drexel University, where I also receive with my colleague, Dr. Ted Corbin, Healing Hurt People, a hospital-based violence intervention and trauma intervention program. Thank you. Natalia? Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Natalia Salcedo. I'm actually the country director for Glasswing here in El Salvador. So it's very nice to be with you guys. Great. That was very efficient. So the question I want to pose to start this off to each of you, and we'll go in the same order starting with Lisa, is um, to give, take about six minutes, um, give or take, to explain your methodology, your model, so to speak and in regards to your work and obviously the topic of the conference. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. I have a brief PowerPoint that I'll share with the group. <clears throat> okay, uh, so as I said, my name is Lisa Pineda. I'm the mental health clinical director for a program called Terra Firma. It is located in the South Bronx um, of New York City. I'm sorry, just give me one second. <laughs> and so um, this program started in 2013. It was developed by a psychologist, Dr. Christina Muniz, uh, a pediatrician, Dr. Alan Shapiro, and an attorney at Catholic Charities. Um, Brett Stark. And so um, they started this program after working with one unaccompanied minor that had medical, legal, and mental health needs um, that they needed to have met. Um, and so they initiated these services um, as a partnership between Montefiore Children's Hospital, um, Catholic Charities, and um, uh, Children's Health Project. And so um, some of the core services that Terra Firma offers are listed here. Um, we do believe that um, an individual receiving mental health services and medical services and legal services, um, a UIC, will certainly be able to have better um, outcomes in each of the areas. Um, so if you notice here, um, it's a patient-centered care. So we offer professional affidavits and evaluations to immigration cases. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
And so um, research also does show that the um, research also shows that uh, mental health outcomes are improved when med and when legal outcomes are also improved. Um, and as we know, UICs are eligible for legal relief. Um, so our mental, our legal services are offered through Catholic Charities New York. Uh, we also offer enrichment through the program, um, through tutoring, English classes, soccer, photography, uh, mindfulness. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into the mental health services in just a moment. Um, so these are some of our demographics at Terra Firma. As I said, Terra Firma was a program that was developed initially to meet the needs and learn more about the needs of UICs, but we have expanded to also work with AWC. Um, and that happened as the need um, for that population did increase. We ended up also working with a great number of the families that were separated either through ZTP or other, um, or other separation uh, causes. So um, as you see, 92% of our population of UIC do speak Spanish. That's not to say that that's their first language. You do work with a great number of children UIC that um, their first language is an indig indigenous language. Um, so as um, also here, I think it's a little higher than this now, but um, thus far mental health and medical affidavits, 165, not any cases lost at trial. Um, these are some of our referral pathways. So while Catholic Charities is our legal partner and we do receive the majority of referrals from there, one of our largest after that is word of mouth. So that's within the community, within other participants from Terra Firma that have had positive outcomes. Um, it's a very community-based program. Um, so you will see um, just families kind of like as they come and arrive, they receive um, with, the, with the kind of rapport that we build with our participants, you do see that um, it builds uh, through word of, mouth, word of mouth referrals. So see, these are some of the goals of Terra Firma. So Terra Firma itself means um, stable ground. So we want to make sure that we're providing that first and foremost. That's where the name comes from. So normalization, we want to make sure that um, adolescents are able to resume the trajectory, um, their developmental trajectory, and start to do some of the things that are part of adolescence. Um, acculturation, so um, fortifying the pieces of their identity that are really important to them. And, if they, and incorporating new parts of their identity as they continue to develop building a sense of community that's within the program that's within their larger community as well um, healing from trauma so we do that through um, individual psychotherapy family psychotherapy group psychotherapy um, fostering resiliency so as we know UICs come with a, a, a plethora of strengths and we want to make sure we continue um, to foster and fortify their resiliency rebuilding family so as we also know, UICs um, either have never met family members they live with or haven't seen them for a really long time. So we want to make sure that we're making, um, and we also know that there can be a kind of honeymoon period and can be like a rough landing as these kids come in. So we want to make sure to support the family. We have a group for um, caregivers and we also provide family therapy. And as I said earlier, it's a medical home. So um, we provide primary care services. And one of the things that we do is um, the, first, uh, the first contact that any kid has with Terra Firma is through a medical appointment. And then that medical provider really works uh, very hard to build rapport and then they connect um, a UIC with us. So that's what we call like a warm handoff. They're going to um, talk a little bit about therapy, how it can be helpful, how it can help their legal case. And then they, have, they just meet us and we just start to build rapport. So we don't start therapy off the bat. Um, and we support the immigration process through um, affidavits as well and letters of support and just communication with their attorney, um, of course, explaining confidentiality. So these are some of the, um, the services we provide for therapy. Some of the mental health outcomes, as you can imagine, that we see are PTSD, complex trauma, culturative stress, um, anxiety, depression, um, adjustment disorders, um, attachment disorders. These are the, some of the things that we see, um, but again, it's patient-centered care. So it's not so much about diagnosis as it is about meeting needs. Um, so we have individual psychotherapy, family group. We do different groups, preteen, teen, and sponsors or caregivers. And just really quickly about our COVID-19 pandemic response. Uh, so Terra Firma is their participants. They're a priority group within our larger clinic for things like emergency pantry. So we've always had a pantry within the clinic, but we've expanded it to include um, household goods and um, fresh food and, and larger benefits from food or um, winter gear. They're, um, 
we also do outreach calls. So that's just for either benefits in kind or other um, particular needs that they might have. We reach out to patients and make sure that they are, they have these, that these particular needs met, particularly like educational support. So with remote learning, for example, um, and then in, we, our clinic never had telehealth before. So one of the things that we started doing when the pandemic in March was um, telehealth, which has um, actually increased mental health visit adherence of 30% from pre-COVID. And that's within the terraferma population as well. I hope I kept it under six minutes. <laughs> that was pretty good. Awesome. Thank you. I have about six minutes, 40 seconds, but that was pretty efficient. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Okay, uh, John Rich, your turn, sir. Thank you. Let me talk a little bit about Healing Hurt People, again, a hospital-based violence intervention program for young people between the ages of eight and 35 who have been shot, stabbed, or assaulted in Philadelphia. This program grew out of the shared experience that I and Dr. Ted Corbin had as providers in inner city hospitals. And what we found was that when young people came in as victims of violence, there was this tacit assumption that somehow they were responsible for their own injuries. And that was further compounded by the fact that we saw people cycling through. Young people who were victims of violence tended to get re-injured. Now there was an assumption on the part of most of the system and our colleagues that they had done something to, got, to get themselves injured. And therefore, after being discharged, they had done something else and gotten themselves injured. But we began to realize, and it doesn't take very long to understand the impact of trauma that these young people had suffered, that in their bodies and in their minds, they were suffering the wounds of having experienced trauma, not only adversity in childhood, but experiencing violence at the hands of the police experiencing and seeing violence in their communities. And so Healing Hurt People attempts to engage young people in that vulnerable moment after injury at the bedside to engage them in healing activities. And the way that it works is we have social workers who are trauma-informed and peers, young people who have had the experience of violent injury themselves and have come to deal with their own trauma and are trained to be able to intervene. They meet young people in the hospital at the bedside and really are providers of care. And in that moment, they provide critical psychoeducation. That is educating young people about the fact that what they're going to feel in the coming days is trauma working itself out. Those flashbacks, those nightmares uh, are, are a result of trauma. They're going to engage young people about making sure that they're safe making sure they have a place to go. So there's an assessment process that looks at safety. The next phase, again, is to engage these young people in case management. Many of them have pending issues with the courts, they have other needs, and they need help navigating those systems because we know that trauma essentially erects a wall in front of you that you can't see past. So case management, and then therapy, individual therapy, these young people heal by giving them their own experience and normalizing this experience of violence and trauma. And then again, navigation and peer support. The goal of Healing Hurt People is certainly to interrupt this cycle of violence and prevent young people from being re-injured or becoming involved in the criminal justice system. But we also recognize that our goal is to improve the well-being of young people how they feel, because not every young person who's injured is on their way towards re-injury or incarceration, but they are, their lives are going to be disrupted by this trauma unless they find a way to heal. And in evaluations of healing hurt people, we find that their engagement improves their sleep quality, reduces symptoms of post-traumatic stress, reduces symptoms of depression, and helps them reintegrate with the positive things in their lives and the relationships that will help them, while also connecting them to needed services that many of them were not connected with, such as primary care uh, or other therapeutic mental health services. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about this. There are, there's a network of hospital-based violence intervention programs across the country and in the UK. 
but we're hoping to transform the healthcare system so that we view these young people in their full humanity and begin to think about their well being as closely linked to the well being of the communities in which all of us live. Thank you, uh, John. That was about five minutes. Um, thank you for being concise. Apologize for some of the background noise. I'm trying to stay vigilant and making sure folks are muted. Um, so I'll continue to do that. Uh, Natalia, uh, you're up next, please. Thanks, Paul. Well, I, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit today about our San Andarida's program model. And it's actually quite interesting because it is basically an adaptation of successful programs in the United States, such as the one that John Rich is talking about, about healing hurt people. Um, we basically wanted to take these models that had worked in the United States and kind of bring them to Latin America and El Salvador in particular. Our objective was basically to be able to provide support to survivors of social violence through trauma-informed care, um, placing a strong emphasis on restorative processes to really help them understand the effects of trauma and gain um, positive coping skills. Our model started changing when we started implementing and we ended up with three core components to the program. So the first one is basically what, what John was uh, explaining, that it's comprehensive trauma care offered to people who enter a hospital emergency room. Uh, they've experienced a traumatic event and they're really provided with the resources to understand a, what just happened to them and actually build up their mental resilience. Our second component came about because we realized that not many people understood what trauma-informed care meant. So we started training healthcare professionals, organizations, local and national institutions, um, basically anyone who was in contact with people who had suffered a traumatic event. Um, we realized that an essential part of the training was actually self-care for that participants because they had to actually process their own traumas in order to be able to offer better support to whoever they were attending, patients in, in particular. So the trainings that we gave them offered more non-traditional tools. Uh, we educated beneficiaries on emotional intelligence or assertive listening, nonviolent communication, social skills and psychological first aid were some of the tools that we were training them on. The third component actually came about because we were not able to do case management. I think the context in El Salvador, the high rates of violence, the strong presence of gangs in the communities does not allow for us to have staff in the hospital to be social care workers that can actually go and visit the patients back in their homes. So we created, um, based on post-care needs, we created a referral ecosystem. So uh, we linked hospitals to health clinics, to schools, to, to community organizations, and we started, we did an online um, referral ecosystem where we could know where the patient had come from and kind of send them back um, and have them transition back into their regular life in a, in a, in a safer environment. We've been implementing um, San Andreas in four hospitals here in El Salvador, and to date we've been able to offer care to more than 900 patients, and we've been training over 2,000 individuals, I think. And I think our, our greatest success, honestly, has been the referral system. We've been able to refer about 500 patients to different services in different parts of the country. Um, Maybe I just want to finish with, with two little things, some of the greatest challenges that I feel like we've, we've seen. The workload of healthcare professionals, um, despite the fact that the program is very well received and that they're willing to implement it, I think the amount of tasks assigned by the Ministry of Health to certain key personnel actually doesn't allow them to perform with the ideal time that we would want them to. So I think the workload is, is, is definitely something we need to work on and, and kind of figure out a way that we can adapt the program to be able to be more efficient and actually get to the people who need the most. And then I think another of our greatest challenges is has been this, this change of, of mindset that they've spoken about this morning earlier as well, is that how do you get mental health to not be just a clinical 
from a clinical perspective? How do you get it to be more holistic, right? How do we get the community to be part of this, uh, part of, of what mental health is and, and not just psychologists and psychiatrists, but how do we all kind of come about? And I think as a part of an effort to systematize and generate evidence, uh, we actually conducted in 2019 a World Bank evaluation to really understand uh, what was the possibility of this type of program to reduce recidivism due to violent injuries and, and also understand kind of the economic benefits of this type of program. I know Leli Zenarte is going to be talking later about in more detail about the actual study that was done, but I do think it's it's very interesting that the preliminary results from the evaluation found that survivors of violence who have been treated by a Sananderida specialist who was trained in trauma-informed care actually reduced their likelihood of committing a violent act by up to 30%. So I think this goes back to what John said, is like we need to break those cycles of violence. And I think this is a program that definitely has the evidence uh, to support the success. And I think it's something that we would love to see uh, scale and replicate to a certain extent. Thanks, Paul. Perfect. Thank you, Natalia. Um, so for those that are in the audience, please um, feel free to ask questions in the chat so that we can pull from during the q and I do see that Kenya Marquez has sent a message to Natalia asking if you can share your website or contact information. So I would encourage all of the speakers to do that. Um, I mean, I know in this day and age, you could pretty much Google anybody and find that, but if you wouldn't mind putting a, a website or email or whatever means you prefer folks learn more about your agencies or yourself. And so um, I think it's a perfect segue, um, Natalia's, kind of ending comments in regards to some difficulties or obstacles that that um, present themselves before each of you in your work. And so if we can get into that, um, because I think we all as, as folks that wanna help people have great ideas and great models that can be very effective, but there are always roadblocks. So if we could start off with Lisa, and if you can share uh, for a few minutes, um, some obstacles that are presented to your organization and how you address them. Um, so I think some of the obstacles have been just kind of um, um, great need and not being able to meet um, and wanting to be able to meet the need or the, the size of the population. Um, as I said, we expanded to start providing services to AWC, um, so family units. Um, initially, we were uh, three mental health providers working part time within the program. Um, and now we've just expanded actually over COVID um, to a much larger team that is able to meet the needs um, so far um, of um, AWC. In addition, I think one of the other things that's been difficult is um, working remotely during COVID and trying to make sure that um, participants have access to devices or to Wi-Fi or to be able to continue to participate in um, mental health interventions or psychotherapy. Um, I think another thing that's been um, pretty difficult is just trying to do some of the things that Terraforma does really well, which is kind of the the, the organic way that um, I think that the, the program relies on kind of like a warm in-person rapport. I think that kind of translating to working remotely has been a real challenge. Um, it used to be that um, every single Wednesday, Catholic Charities would come and provide legal consultation, not just to those that were their clients, but others that were in the community that wanted that needed legal consultation. Um, that same Wednesday, they would, we would have group, we would have nutrition classes, we would have medical appointments, all of that would happen on site. Um, and not being able to provide that and trying to transition to remote and continuing to provide the same level of support has been extremely challenging. Um, and as I said, you know, there's some things that we modified to be able to continue to provide the services, but I think in person, um, without that, without that organic piece, it, it has been really challenging for us. Thank you, John. Yes, I, I would agree. And I would add that the, um, these young people come with significant need and untapped and almost unlimited potential. There is, however, I think on the part of um, the larger provider community and funders, the expectation 
that you can serve large numbers of young people um, without regard to the intensity of the need. So the needs, the wounds are deep and when they heal, these young people are incredibly strong. But there is a kind of dichotomy that, that I link to a kind of dehumanization of these young people, which says that if, if something terrible were to hap happen to me, then I would expect and, and be able to expect therapeutic intervention a lot of time. But here there's a kind of quick fix idea that these young people just need a good lecture, good talking to. And so we're overcoming a societal bias about these young people and the depth of their need. And so we really do need to spend significant time with young people. We need to have significant staff uh, to meet their needs. We have been able in Pennsylvania to uh, establish a relationship with the behavioral health payer so that we're now able to receive reimbursement for the services that young people receive as truly necessary mental health services. That is not the case nationally. And so we do, there is a need to recognize, just as Natalia was saying, these kinds of services are critical, critical behavioral health services that accrue to the health and well-being of the individual and the community. And they may save dollars down the road. That's, that's important for us to know. But again, as it is important to hold that the individual well-being of a human being is what we'd want and expect. And so we're, we're looking to advocate for a model that allows for reimbursement through a variety of physical and behavioral health reimbursement down the road. Awesome, thank you, John. And uh, Natalia, you, you kind of started to touch on some of the challenges towards the end of your last comments. And so if you can kind of continue to elaborate on that, especially in the context of Central America, which differentiates you from the other two speakers. I think something that adding to what, what John and Lisa said, because I totally agree with, with the point of view, is that getting to inter getting the ministries of education and health to actually internalize what we believe Sananderia to be, that mental health has to be kind of a transversal topic. No matter where we're working, we need to work with mental health because we're talking about individuals and we need to think about the, the individuals giving care as well as the patients who we wanna treat. And I think that mentality or that change of, of culture is it's very hard and, and, and very time consuming. And I think it needs like a bottom up approach and a top to bottom approach at the same time, because you have to start working with the people who work with the patients to try to get them to, to, to heal themselves. Um, and you also have to work with the higher up. The minister has to be a, an approval of you going into a hospital and actually implementing a program. So I think that dynamic of, of finding where the resources will be more, more useful or better, um, better equipped will depend also on the context of the country and the openness to want to work with mental health. I think COVID has actually just really changed where mental health has positions itself in, in the world. I do think it's, it's been elevated to something that we, we can all agree that being home all the time, working from home, not being able to mobilize, having your kids around, or, you know, all these circumstances have actually brought mental health to be more on top of mind of everyone. And I think that's very important because it's something that probably should have happened a long time ago and it just hasn't. So I think we're in that moment in time that we can, it's a big challenge, but we can use COVID to actually potentiate it even more, to, to make it really, for us to be able to make a big difference in our countries and I think in the world, I think it's something that we can definitely look forward to. Um, and starting this year, I think it's, we're still in pandemic, but we're starting a new year. And I think there's always that new energy of, of, of a new time. Thank you, Natalia. We, um, I've been told we have about 15 minutes left. So what I'll try to do is give each of you five minutes and give each of you a specific question. And so I was asked to, to ask Lisa if she can elaborate on the medical home that you all have, what it entails, um, just a description on that for the audience, please. Um, so 
It's a larger clinic, which is called Bronx Health Collective, which is a part of Montefiore Hospital. So it's a primary care clinic um, that does offer um, just basic medical care and um, connecting with um, more specialty care if needed. So it, the program actually started out as um, a mobile unit um, in the 80s. And so the program has expanded um, since that time. Obviously, it, it encompasses three separate clinics. One is an adult clinic, one is a um, clinic for children, and, and the other is for um, homeless population or on-house population. So um, <clears throat> it initially starts there and medical home just being that, um, you know, we assist with insurance and as you know, UICs are able to have uh, health insurance within um, or undocumented able, children unable to have health insurance within New York State. So we, we assist with insurance, we assist with um, referrals for a specialty care for dentistry. We used to also have um, dentistry within a mobile unit as well. Um, but so we connect uh, families and children with other services if needed. And so um, the mental health services are co-located. So once the, once the child or the family member is connected with medical services, the referral is made to mental health, but it's really about um, kind of like building rapport before it is, you know, that we're doing any sort of mental health intervention. It's starting really with building rapport. Um, and it's very patient-centered care and we work kind of um, in tandem medical and mental health. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, absolutely. It sounds like a home that creates a space where people can kind of hang out, connect with each other, and like a sense of belonging and, and yes, kinship. exactly. Cool, perfect. Um, John, here's a, a question for you, and I get I, I hear this a lot in regards to hospital-based approaches. And um, how? What are the challenges when you have to convince the healthcare system, other doctors, other departments, or hospital administrators to support your work. Um, how, how has that been for you over the years? Well, I, I think that there is a, a challenge that we have in articulating the value of an intervention that really is both a kind of clinical intervention, but also a public, inter public health intervention in a medical setting. Unfortunately, many healthcare institutions don't view their role more broadly in terms of public health. And so what is the value equation for the hospital? Well, one um, is that the providers there in the emergency department, for example, do care about this issue. They are concerned when they see young people cycle through. It's dispiriting to them. And so they may not know what to do about it. And it can lead them to develop a kind of compassion fatigue that has its own trauma spiral. But when my colleague, Dr. Corbin, did a focus group with emergency medicine providers and asked them what they needed to be able to make a difference here, they said they, they needed an easy button. That is, they cared about it, but they couldn't do it themselves. They couldn't be... As we talked about, folks are overburdened often with lots of work. They said if they could call someone who could come and make a difference, they would do that. And so that is a value here for the efficiency of the healthcare system. We talk a lot about readmission to the hospital, but we don't talk about it in the context of, of injury. We also know although it's not as much embraced, that hospitals have a community responsibility. They here do not pay taxes. Nonprofit facilities do not pay taxes. And so they have a responsibility in lieu of those taxes. And so to the extent that larger systems, the state organized, sometimes it's the attorney general's office, holds institutions accountable, this becomes something that they can hold up as a connection to the community. And often it is something, it's a problem and a concern that emerges when they do their community health assessment. So it's an opportunity for the institution to be, um, to respond to their responsibility. And then finally, in the best possible way, there are learning opportunities for physicians in training, nurses in training, uh, the whole range of uh, behavioral health 
people who are working in these institutions. And so one, one educational opportunity is to bring young people back who have been through the emergency department, who have experienced that, to have a frank conversation with providers about what was helpful to them in that moment, what was not helpful to them in that moment. Then it becomes a learning opportunity uh, to make providers more trauma aware, more community engaged, and then to expose young people to the possibilities and the opportunities that may exist for them to enter healthcare professions in the future. Awesome answer, very well stated. Thank you for that, sir. Um, I have one for uh, Natalia, and it's, it's kind of along the lines of what some folks are submitting in the chat, and it's a difficult question. Um, Natalia, so I apologize ahead of time, but how do you get a country like El Salvador or actually Central America, right, the triangle, so to speak, to embrace um, from the government to the police to the community, um, to embrace a, a trauma-informed lens or a mental health approach? Um, I remember several years ago, I visited El Salvador and spoke with about 100 police officers, and they all said they were if they wanted to get counseling for their trauma, they were afraid uh, for the fact that they would be demoted by their superior, they'd be made fun of by their coworkers. And so as professionals and, and first responders and police, they, for many reasons, don't, um, don't seek help. So I know it's a large, difficult question, but some folks are asking, and I'd like to know your, your uh, response to that. So I think, obviously, it's, it's a change of, of mentality, right? It's like, kind of moving from that clinical perspective to more of a well-being perspective. Like, okay, we're going to be working on mental health, but we might not call it mental health. We're going to call it, let's do a self-care because we need to reduce stress because the times have been really tough. So I think it's just simplifying what you're doing because in the end, what you're giving them is tools for them to be able to process their day-to-day -day activities, right? If you're a policeman and you're in, in communities that are super high risk and then you're in an event that is, is a partner of yours got shot like how do you process that how do you process it with your coworkers? and I think um, one of the things that was super interesting we just had a meeting we've been talking a lot in, in the country about how do we make it something how does mental health elevate to the point that the different uh, sectors actually work together and and it's it's top priority um, and we had some doctors who had actually taken our Sananderidas course, who had gotten moved from the hospitals where we work to like the national hospital who's actually taking care of the COVID cases. It's like the National El Salvador Hospital that got built for COVID. And he was talking about his experience and how going through a process where you can actually have tools to use on yourself, but also he was like, I wasn't even using it with the patients. I was using it with my coworkers, with other frontline workers, because they were freaked out that they have to go into this hospital. They don't want to go in, you know? And so it's kind of like, how do you work with, with your coworkers, with your family members, how to process certain feelings of stress and anxiety so that when you do go in, you go in and you give a better service to whoever you are going to be attending. And so I think his experience was very kind of eye-opening, like, wow, you're taking something that we thought was going to kind of just help the patients from the hospital to moving to you're actually helping your entire team who's going in to treat COVID cases uh, in a very intense uh, environment to actually be able to process it in a, in a better way and have them have better outputs with the actual patients and family members who they're working with. So I think that to me was kind of like, wow, you can actually, whatever you use, you, you receive in terms of tools you use for yourself and you use for the community that surrounds you. Great, thank you. So we have about five minutes left. So uh, I'd like to give each of you perhaps a minute or two to uh, share closing remarks with everybody. Um, if it's a couple words of encouragement or a, or a tool or a comment, um, and we'll start with Lisa. Um, I think first and foremost, I, I really just wanna say thank you so much for allowing Terra Firma to be a part of this. Um, we are really passionate about the work we do and love to learn about organizations that are just as passionate as us trying to help this population. Um, and I just feel very grateful to be a part and then everybody's doing this work. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Go ahead, John. I likewise am grateful for this opportunity to have a conversation. And one of the things that 
comes up again and again is how do we change mindset? How do we change how people view this issue? And so we, a couple of years ago, and I put this in the chat, launched a social media campaign called Our Words Heal. We're not experts in social media, but we have some great partners. And the goal was to open a space where people in community affected by violence and trauma could add their voices because there's this notion that somehow we as experts know their experience. And that's a distorted notion. The other piece is that communities have been healing for generations. Communities, black and brown communities have been healing from tremendous trauma in culturally responsive ways. And yet those don't make it into the conversation. And this opens a space for all of us to contribute to a conversation about what's healing. So I would just encourage, we'd love feedback about Our Words Heal on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. There's also a website, wecanhealfromtrauma.org as a way to try and change this larger conversation and engage policymakers and practitioners in a broader dialogue that does not stigmatize communities, but also but contributes to the healing that all of us have to engage in. Thank you for this opportunity. Awesome, thank you, John. Natalia? Hey, yeah, thank you as well for, for having me this morning. Um, I just wanna echo what, what maybe John and, and Lisa are saying is that I do think that it's it's great that we have this community, but I would I would really like to see the community of healing grow and, and for us to have more exchanges where we can actually learn um, what others are doing and kind of try to see how we can integrate more innovative approaches to, to what we've seen works, but that we always know that everything can always be done a little bit better. So to me, it's like, if you have any feedback on things that have worked wherever you are, um, we'd love to hear them. We'd love to, to see if, if things that work in other countries might work in El Salvador as well, or we, we're actually in other countries in Central America and try to test out if, if every country is different, but even every hospital is different and every clinic is different. And so I think the dynamics, it's important to be able to, to, to innovate and change. And so I would love to hear uh, what, what others are doing to, to grow as well. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Thank all the speakers. It uh, looks like we're going to finish on time. I do want to say that our speakers and a couple of other folks have shared some information, some links and some emails in the chat. So please, um, if, if you want, copy those down before the session ends, because I think it, it goes away. But I'm, I'm sure you can email the event staff and, and get the information if you miss it. I just want to thank Glasswing. Uh, for putting this together and all the sponsors and of course our speakers for sharing their expertise and their knowledge on, on the issue that we're discussing and um, and thank all of the attendees for keeping yourselves muted and for being patient um, and for sharing in the chat and this concludes this breakout session and thank you all have a good day thank you bye